In the first few days of Ramadan, Washington DC was cold and rainy, but it was worth it because the American College of Cardiology ACC meeting was back in person after two years of virtual attendance. This year, the meeting had 12,000 professional attendees, 260 exhibitors from 107 countries. 3,000 abstracts were presented in almost hundreds of sessions. ACC is the biggest cardiology meeting in the world, with comprehensive coverage of almost all aspects of cardiovascular diseases, and I had the chance to attend it in person and report to you. ACC touches the lives of more than 56,000 members and untold patients in our mission to transform cardiovascular care and improve heart health. I also want to take a moment to recognize the millions of people, including so many of our own colleagues, friends, and mentors who have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the last two years. That was the voice of Dr. Dipti Echapuria. She's the president of the American College of Cardiology in the opening ceremony of the conference. And in this episode of CardioBuzz, I'm bringing you what I think would be the best late-breaking clinical trials announced in the ACC meeting last week. More than 20 trials were announced as late-breaking clinical trials, as well as another bunch of featured clinical research, and I decided to choose only five trials to present here. So stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Cardio Buzz, your weekly cardiology podcast presented by Dr. Hussein Hishmat, professor of cardiology and interventional cardiologist. Every week, we bring you a selection of practice changing research, conference proceedings, guidelines, news, and interviews with experts. The podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Choosing the top five trials from more than 20 late-breaking clinical trials was challenging. I decided to choose the ones that I felt would have a bigger impact on a larger number of patients or physicians, or those trials that would bring in newer concepts or change our views on medicine in general. So let's start the countdown from the fifth trial to the best trial. Number 5. Do electronic medical records improve heart failure prescription? Electronic medical records change the way we practice medicine. They have obvious advantages when it comes to documentation, but I cannot hide the fact that it makes us spend more time in front of screens rather than in front of patients. However, these electronic systems can prove useful in other aspects, for example by nudging the doctors we might improve our prescription habits and overcome the inertia in prescribing medications or uptitrating them. And one of the domains in which inertia is evident is heart failure. Guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure is under-prescribed. We usually do not prescribe the four essential medications combined, and we even rarely uptitrate them to the maximum tolerable dose. The PROMPT HF trial which was recently announced in the ACC, and I chose it as number five, was not a study on patients, but it was a study on doctors. 100 healthcare providers caring for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction in the outpatient were randomized to either the usual care on the system or extra alerts on the system. These alerts started working at the moment the physicians start to prescribe the medications. The alerts highlighted the patient's heart rate, blood pressure, creatinine, potassium, and EGFR. The system notified the provider if there's a missing medication or if there's a need to titrate the dose. And these electronic alerts increased eventually the guideline directed medical therapy prescription by more than 40% and were highly significant, especially for beta blockers. Moreover, 79% of the alerted doctors by the system agreed that the alert was effective in enabling improved prescription of medical therapies for heart failure. This is a low-cost intervention and can be integrated easily into clinical care 
and can accelerate the adoption of therapies for heart failure. So next time, don't be angry when the system alerts you to the need of increasing the beta blocker dose or starting an MRA. Number four, does treatment of mild hypertension improve pregnancy outcomes? We know that treating hypertension does prevent strokes, MIs, and heart failure. But in pregnancy, it's a bit different. Unless hypertension is severe and complicated by eclampsia, we don't have strong evidence that treating hypertension can improve pregnancy outcomes, given the potential hazards of drugs on the fetus. The CHAP trial announced in the ACC last week enrolled 2,400 ladies with mild chronic hypertension, the blood pressure less than 160. They were all pregnant ladies less than 23 weeks, and they were assigned to either treatment to a blood pressure goal less than 140 over 90, or treatment only when the blood pressure reaches 160 over 105. The the most commonly prescribed medications were labetalol, and nifedipine. The researchers found significantly lower rates of severe preeclampsia, preterm birth, placental abruption, neonatal and fetal death among the pregnant ladies who received the treatment compared with those who received the treatment only at a blood pressure of 160. And the absolute difference was 7% and this is huge. There was also a trend towards fewer deaths pulmonary edema, renal failure, and ICU admission with the active treatment group to less than 140 millimeters mercury. There was no significant difference in the rates of babies who were small for gestational age, and this is reassuring. So why is this trial important? It tells us that we have to treat pregnant ladies if their blood pressure reaches 140 over 90. This is not only important for long-term cardiovascular outcomes, but it's also important for saving the pregnancy itself. Number three, a new medical treatment provides an alternative to surgery for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The drug is called Mavacamptin. I would like you to remember this name because I guess it will have a good future. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy affects roughly 1% of the population, mostly being asymptomatic, but it still can result in left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, sudden death, and marked limitation of effort tolerance. The best therapy that we had for this condition was surgical excision of the hypertrophied muscle or ablation of the vessel feeding this muscle, whereas medical therapy had a limited role. Until Mavacamptin came. This is a myosin chain inhibitor and a negative enotropic agent. It was tested back in 2020 in the Explorer HCM trial, and it resulted in significant improvement on patient symptoms, exercise capacity, and quality of life compared to placebo. It was also shown that when when it was titrated, up titrated, or down titrated based on the gradient and the ejection fraction to achieve dramatic improvements in functional class, N-terminal pro-BNP, and interestingly, the gradient. This medication was associated with 36 millimeters mercury reduction of gradient roughly 75% from the baseline. But these were only observational trials. In the Valor HCM, which was announced last week in the ACC, 112 patients were enrolled. They all had a very thick septum, they had severe symptoms despite medical therapy, and an LV gradient of more than 50 millimeters of mercury and an ejection fraction of 60%. Patients were assigned to Mavacamptin or placebo. And Mavacamptin again resulted in reduction on the LVOT gradient, improvement in the functional class, reduction of pro-BNP, and reduction of troponin. At 16 weeks, only 18% of patients on Mavacamptin were still eligible for surgery or cath, compared to 77% of those who were on placebo. And no patients experienced serious adverse cardiac events. And this has never been shown in any medical therapy for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This can change the way we treat this disease. Septal reduction therapies like surgery or catheters are likely to 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 decrease dramatically. Mavacamptin is currently under review with the US FDA 
for the use in obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We expect a decision by the end of April 2022, and I personally cannot wait to see this drug becoming available for our hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Number 2. Tranexamic acid and bleeding in non-cardiac surgery. This is a trial that would be of great interest to surgeons, vascular surgeons, internists, intensivists, not just cardiologists. There are 300 million surgeries annually worldwide, and perioperative bleeding is a major event and should be avoided at any cost. Tranexamic acid is an old medication and it's a cheap drug. It's routinely used by cardiac surgeons on bypass machines and also to stop postpartum hemorrhage. The perioperative ischemia evaluation 3 POISE 3 trial that was announced in the ACC randomized more than 9,000 patients who were going for surgery. These patients were at risk for bleeding and cardiovascular complication. They all had either a known atherosclerotic disease or they were undergoing a major vascular surgery or they are above the age of 70 or they had impaired renal functions. Patients were randomized to receive tranexamic acid as a 1 gram IV bolus or placebo at the start and the end of surgery. The surgeries were general surgery, vascular surgery, urologic surgery, thoracic surgery and other procedures. Tranexamic acid reduced life-threatening bleeding, reduced major bleeding and reduced bleeding into a critical organ by 24% relative risk reduction and 2.6% absolute risk reduction. Again, this is a big reduction. This came at a slight 0.3% excess risk of ischemic events, which is, in my opinion, still acceptable because patients prefer and we prefer to avoid bleeding and transfusions. What are the implications of this trial? Currently, only a small proportion of patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery receive tranexamic acid. And there is an annual global shortage of 30 million blood products and blood units. And surgical bleeding accounts for up to 40% of all transfusions. If we can reduce the bleeding by 24%, then we can save millions of blood products and blood units. This can have the potential for a large public health and clinical benefits if tranexamic acid becomes standard practice in non-cardiac surgery. Number one, supermarket-based interventions for cardiovascular risk reduction. Why did I choose this trial as number one? Because this is a trial that was not conducted in a hospital or in a clinic, it was conducted in a personal grocery store. This was a trial that was done jointly by academic researchers and a big grocery store chain it's called Kruger. The academics designed the study and ran the analysis, while Kruger, which is the largest grocery store chain in the US, provided in-store dietitians, clinical space, and 247 participants grocery purchasing data. Participants who were going to the grocery shop were randomized into three groups. A control group that received a general nutritional education inside the store with a dietitian. And this education was one session, a general education that was not tailored to the participant. The other group had seven in-store nutritional educational sessions that focused on following the DASH diet. And the third group had also seven one-on-one -on -one in-store nutritional education sessions plus training tools for online shopping, free home grocery delivery, identification of healthier foods and meal planning. The sessions in both intervention groups were personalized. They were guided by the individual purchasing data, the bill, the what did he buy from the supermarket. These data were provided to the dietitian and the dietitians in the grocery stores were also informed of the participants tastes cooking experience and food allergies so that they can make their recommendation even better and more personalized so what happened in the two groups where the dietitians provided advice inside the grocery store three months later the later two groups 
who had educational sessions, they found a significant increase in their adherence to the DASH score, to the DASH diet score. The DASH diet is the diet that is rich in vegetables, fruits, low-fat dairy products, and less in saturated fats and trans fatty acids. And combining in-store nutritional education with online tools increased the adherence to the DASH diet even furthermore. What are the implications of the trial? We know that even small changes in the diet can have enormous health impacts, especially if they are sustained over time. And this study proves that grocery-based interventions do have an impact and may bridge the gap between what people are told by doctors from the guidelines and what they end up buying from the grocery store. I like the idea and it would be great to have it here. In many countries, blood pressure is measured by the pharmacist who can also guide the purchase of over-the-counter medications. So why not the grocery chains, the hire dietitians who can advise customers on how to eat healthier? I think this will be great. Tell me your personal view on this topic. And see you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cardio Buzz. If you like the content, follow the show on your favorite podcast platform, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You will find previous episodes and get alerts to new ones. Please rate the show and write your own review of the content. You can share the episodes to spread knowledge and benefit. Enjoy your weekend and see you next Saturday.